Hi everyone, I'm Brian Dobbins. I'm a software engineer here at NCAR. Uh, I hope you've all had a great week learning all about CESM. I'm not going to teach you anything new about the model itself, but rather show you how you can continue learning to use it on your own laptop or desktop via a project we call CESM Lab. Feel free to follow along as we go, pausing this video as needed to do any required steps. This will require downloading some software called Docker onto your laptop or desktop and downloading a few gigabytes of data to get started. So it could take a while depending on your internet speeds. Finally, everything I'm going to cover is pretty new technology for us. It's still in development, so we'd love feedback so we can improve this moving forward for the community. Here's a quick overview of what we'll cover today, starting with a brief look at what CESM Lab actually is. After that, I'll discuss how to download Docker and how to get this model software itself. Then I'll give brief examples of how to launch it on both Windows and Mac or Linux systems. We'll spend a few minutes looking at a very basic Jupyter-based tutorial uh, we've included for now. And we'll talk a little bit about how we expect to expand on this in the future. And since some of you might be a little old school like myself, I'll discuss how to use the terminal included via, uh, versus the Jupyter interface. Finally, we'll close out with a quick discussion of some limitations, since obviously the current target here is for personal systems, which have considerably less power than supercomputers like Cheyenne. Last but not least, I'll briefly cover some future plans. So what is CESM Lab? Well, simply enough, it's just a pre-configured environment with both CESM and Jupyter Lab. It's portable and ready to run pretty much anywhere. Uh, containers are the key technology here. They're a technology that lets you package up a whole environment for an application like CESM and provide it in this simple, portable form. For us, this isn't just the model source code, but also all the libraries, compilers, tools, and more that go into having a usable environment for modeling. Given the rapidly growing interest in Jupyter Notebooks and the growth of things like the Pangeo Project and NCAR's Earth System Data Science Initiative, we can also include a full stack of Python packages needed for visualization and analysis. Best of all, this means anything we provide in this environment that works for one person will work for another. No struggling to add new libraries or dependencies, it just works. You can focus on shareable science instead of wrestling with conda environments or installing tools. This also allows for the development of common materials for training like we'll see and use later on. If you're not familiar with Jupyter, don't worry. You can still use a traditional terminal environment in multiple ways too, and we'll cover that a little later on. So the first step here is to download Docker. Docker is a common container application. It's free to use, easy to install. Uh, you will need admin privileges though, and it's pretty user friendly. If you go to that link shown here, uh, uh, it'll show you what it thinks is right for your system. In my case, I'm on a Mac, so it shows me these options. If you're following this presentation at your own pace, I'd recommend pausing this presentation now, installing the doc Docker software, and then resuming. Okay, great. If you have Docker, now we can download the CESM lab image. Open a terminal or command prompt and run this docker pull command shown above. This will download all the CESM software. This image is about four gigabytes in size. So once again, if you're following along to this video at your own pace, I recommend pausing it until it's complete. Okay, now let's talk about running the container. So both Mac and Windows offer a GUI for Docker. You can use that or the command line. Ultimately, both work the same. I've seen more people using the GUI on Windows, so these screenshots are from Windows, and the command line ones will be from a Mac system, but it's the same two options you need to set. So once you launch the GUI dashboard, this is often the top of your Mac screen or in the Windows Start menu, you should see the container listed among the images we have, like in the image above. Uh, from here, we're just going to click on the Run button. Now, to be fully functional, we need to provide two settings to Docker. The first is a port, circled here in purple. This just lets us communicate with the containerized Jupyter environment via a browser. Generally, we just use 8888 and only need to change it if another piece of software is already listening to that port. The second option we're providing is a mount point, circled here in red. What this does is make a directory of our choosing on our system visible to the containerized environment, letting us ensure all of our work, model cases, output data, scripts, etc., are all saved when you exit the container. Once we set these values, Click Run, and you're off and running. If you follow the previous two slides, this is more of the same, only via the command line. This approach works on Mac, Windows, and Linux. If you're using CESM, you're probably using a terminal at some point, so I highly recommend trying things this way, even if you're more at ease with the GUI mode. But if you already launched it using the GUI, skip this step for now and just try it next time. So just the same as the GUI method, we need to tell Docker two important things a directory to map into the container, and a port to connect to the Jupyter server running. For the directory specified with the V option, as seen in red here, we can specify whatever we want. 
If it doesn't exist, it'll be created. In the example here, I'm choosing to use a directory called CESM work in my home directory. This gets mapped to slash home slash user in the container. For ports, using the dash P option seen in purple here, I'm using the default, mapping port 8888 from my system to port 8888 of the container where the Jupyter server listens. Again, if you're already using Jupyter on your system, this port might be in use. In that case, you can switch the first number to something different. For example, 9999. Press enter and you'll see some output like the above. One thing that admittedly causes some confusion is the Jupyter log messages that say a browser can't be found. We can ignore those. We're running Jupyter inside the container and using our own browser to connect. We'll change this in a future version to be a bit more clear. At this point, if you've done either of the prior steps, you should have a running container, but not really much to show for it yet. That's just because it runs as a background process. To do anything, we need to connect to it. We'll do that by opening up a web browser with Firefox shown here and connect to our local system on the port we provided in those options we used when launching it. So open up the browser, go to 127.0.0.1 colon 8888 or whatever port you used instead of 8888 and press enter and you should be greeted by the Jupyter Lab welcome screen. Of course, there's not a lot to see here yet, especially if we didn't map in an existing directory, but that's okay. We do have this tutorials directory, which is what we're going to explore next. So let's pull up these tutorials. To do this, on the left side of the Jupyter screen, double click on the tutorials. That should open up the folder and show you the second image above with the file indexed at ipynb. Uh, this is our main page for the tutorials. It's a Jupyter notebook file. Double click on it and it should open right up. This is the main page for what will be a set of tutorials, though at the moment there's really just a quick start. We will be improving this in the future, but that quick start is still going to give you a basic overview of using Jupyter with CESM. There's also a link to the forums for asking questions, but for now, let's click on the quick start link uh, shown at the bottom of the screenshot above. For anyone unfamiliar with a Jupyter notebook, this is an example of what one looks like. It has cells, seen by the blue line on the left, of text or documentation and when you scroll down, you'll see some executable cells as well. You could run this whole notebook and it would proceed through each runnable cell, creating a case, setting it up, building it, running it, running it some more, and providing a quick visualization of the result. But it's probably better to go step by step. So we'll look at the first cell in the next slide. Here's our first runnable cell. It's a pretty standard create new case command with just a few small differences. For one, we don't need to navigate to a particular directory here. We know we're using CESM 2.2 since that's the image we downloaded. And two, you'll note we're using a really coarse resolution and a QPC4 comp set, which is an aquaplanet with CAM4 physics. That's a pretty low resolution old physics setup. So why are we using it? Mostly because it's fast. You've been running on Cheyenne on multiple nodes, whereas now we're running on a laptop most likely. This is something we can reasonably run with limited memory and time. Note that the container is not limited to these low res modes. If you have a workstation or server with more than 128 gigs of RAM and a lot of processors, you could use this same container to run a fully coupled B comp set at one degree resolution too. But this is good for experimenting and a lot of useful models like single column cases or simple models run fairly well on laptops. Uh, finally, uh, one thing for people who are familiar with Jupyter is we're actually doing something non-standard here for the purposes of this very introductory lesson. That is, normally to run code in a Jupyter cell, you'd want to specify it's to be run in a bash prompt or we run Python code directly. Here, we're sort of cheating a little bit so that we're running the exact same command we'd use in a terminal inside the Jupyter environment. This only works for single commands and later tutorials will cover more correct ways to do things. After running the cell, you should see all the usual CESM output. This is identical to what you see when running via a command line. And the only real difference is that in the container, we detect how many processors you have and use that for the PE count. On modern laptops, this typically ranges from two to eight cores, but on Cheyenne, this would use 36 cores, a single node. As you progress through this quick start, you'll do a few basic modifications. Again, using commands you're already familiar with. In this case, we're setting up our run for only three model days. On my laptop, a 2018 Mac with four cores, it takes about 20 seconds per model day to run. So this should take about a minute. But before we run, we still need to build the model. That alone can take about five minutes. So if you're working along with this at your own pace, I recommend pausing this here, following the rest of the steps in the quick start. 
All told, it should take between 20 to 40 minutes to do everything, which includes running for a full month, then plotting some output. Obviously, the actual amount of time will depend on your system's processors and how long it takes to download a little bit of data. But let's return once you're set. Okay, great. I hope you made it through all the steps in the quick start by now. If you have, you should see two plots in your notebook, the first looking just like the one above. At this point, you've run a full CESM case on your own system via a Jupyter notebook and did a quick Python-based visualization of the output. This is, as the slide says, just an example of how you can combine documentation, code, and analysis or visualization in Jupyter notebooks. They're a really great way of organizing and displaying work, and you can share CESM lab notebooks with others and they can replicate your work. This is just the very tip of the iceberg on CESM analysis and visualization, though. Making more complex visualizations is an ever-evolving topic, and NCAR recently launched an Earth System Data Science Initiative, ESDS, that I'd encourage you to look into if this interests you with the link above. It's a growing community offering expertise and ideas on how to use Python and notebooks to do data science. Okay, let's step back a bit now. If you've gone through the whole quick start notebook and find that you prefer using a terminal over a notebook, no problem. There's actually a few ways of launching a terminal in a container. For now, we'll just cover the Jupyter method. To do this, just use the File, New, Terminal option. That should give you this browser-based terminal. It's a full environment using the Bash shell by default. It'll let you navigate your files, run commands, edit files, and use standard Linux utilities as you would on any other system. As you can see in the screenshot above, we can also directly call CESM commands like create new case without having to navigate to a particular scene directory too. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some limitations you might encounter with this. So obviously when switching from running on a large cluster like Cheyenne to a personal system, you have fewer resources. So if your laptop only has eight gigabytes of RAM, for example, you won't be able to run the CAM6 Aqua Planet at one degree since it needs about 15 gigabytes. Uh, but if you install it to a workstation or server with 32 gigabytes, that should work fine. For a little bit of reference, our QPC4 at uh, F45 resolution, this is what we used in the quick start, only needs about a half a gigabyte of RAM. Another interesting data point is this B1850C4 tutorial comp set, which is a coupled run, but using less intensive CAM4 physics, and that only needs about eight gigabytes of RAM to run, letting you run a coupled model on some newer laptops. It is pretty slow though. Switching to data, CESM downloads input data that it needs for a case, typically when submitting it for the first time. For many cases, it's relatively small amounts, but some LAN cases require hundreds of gigabytes of data. Granted, it only needs to download this once, saving it in the directory you mounted in, and then it can be used for any number of runs of that comp set, but be aware you may need lots of disk space. Finally, not listed here, it should be obvious that performance also drops greatly if you go from running on hundreds of processors to just a few. The key here though is that these are all hardware limitations of whatever system you're using. The environment is a fully functional version of CESM. And we'll talk now on the next slide a bit about how we're using the same technology that works on your laptop to help you run this on university clusters in the near future. So if you think, hey, this is pretty neat, but I wanna run large fully coupled runs on my university cluster, but have trouble porting CESM, uh, then drop us a line. Uh, we're working on a container specifically for this and we'd love to coordinate with you on trying it out. We also have the ability to run an Amazon Web Services and soon Azure, and hope to make these public in the near future. This is great if you don't have your own clusters, but it gets expensive pretty fast compared to local systems. Another thing we're looking to do in the future is being able to offload a run from this laptop desktop CESM lab to NCAR or the cloud if you have accounts on either. This lets you do everything, including build cases via a local system, but then run on bigger ones with more, lots more resources. This is great for development, especially if you're doing source mods. You can make sure it all works and then just offload the runs elsewhere. Finally, uh, we're hoping to expand the tutorials in the near future, ideally offering a full set of training examples for people to learn on, including running the model, analyzing output, and visualizing results. And that's it for your brief introduction to CESM Lab. Uh, thank you for your time. I hope this helps you get started with CESM and Jupyter. And uh, please let us know any feedback you have so we can improve this to make it even better for the community. Thank you very much.